Uh, I have introduced uh, grammars last time. I didn't say what context-free means last time. I introduced grammars, and uh, I'm not sure that that introduction was uh, was enough. So, so let's try to uh, you know review the uh, the concepts of uh, grammars. Uh, so, what's a grammar? So, how, let's you know informally. How would you uh, how would you define a grammar? What is it conceptually, informally? What is it? What what you know? What did you get from last lecture? So what's a grammar? Yeah. There are the rules of how to construct strings. Or okay, how to generate strings that belong to a certain language. So the basically, <coughs> you know, informally, it's just a set of rules. Uh, for defining a language. What kind of language are we talking about here? A formal language, right? So we're not talking about a, a human language or a programming language. We're talking about a formal language. Now, the kind of grammars that we defined last time, so we defined a grammar for this language. We started with this language. Uh, did I use zero one or a? It doesn't matter. A, a n uh, b n such that n is greater than or equal to zero. So we started. We defined a grammar for this language because this is a language that we could not express using regular expressions. We could not recognize using uh, finite automata because it's a non-regular language, w and we proved that it's a non-regular language. In fact, as we will see. Grammars can recognize uh, or can generate a larger set of languages, including regular languages. So you can still, as we will see later, you can still use grammars to generate any regular language. So grammars generate regular languages plus non-regular languages. And I will, I will uh, make this more precise uh, once I define the grammar for this. So the grammar for this is AS. B or epsilon. By the way, you can write it like this. You can write it S is A S B S. You can write it as two separate rules or productions. We call each one of these, this is a rule or a production. And this is another rule or another production. So you can write them separately. But this is more convenient and more uh, uh, concise <coughs> where you write uh, both, you know, because both rules define the same variable or uh, the same, uh, uh, yeah, the same variable. So this is rule number one. This is num rule number two. So we just put them together. And the relation is or. So this is or. So it's, it's just saying S is, is either ASB or epsilon. And this is just another way of saying it. But in both cases, each one of these is a separate rule or production. Okay. Now, what do I mean by context-free? In a context-free grammar, every rule will have only one variable on the left hand side and it doesn't have you know we have variables and we have what what did we call these terminals, terminals. yeah so like constants so we have variables and constants here we call the constants terminals so the terminals belong to the alphabet so the the, the terminals are symbols from the alphabet so and the you know, the actual strings that will get generated will consist only of terminals. So when you do a derivation, when you do a derivation, you start with S, which is the start variable. And then you derive, you keep substituting. And at the end, the leaves of the tree should have only terminals. So the root of the tree is, the root of the derivation tree is the start variable. And the leaves are terminals. Uh, we showed this last time. We can show it again. 
because this is a new concept for most of you. Uh, in fact, how many people have seen grammars before? Okay, only one person. Yeah, maybe <coughs> have taken an equivalent class or something. Uh, yeah, but for the vast majority, uh, people have not seen grammars before. Okay, so this is a rule. <coughs> so this is context-free, where on the left-hand side you have a single variable. So this is not context-free. So if you have something like this. This is not a context-free grammar. This is a context-sensitive grammar. Context-sensitive grammar. Now, <coughs> in this course, we will not deal with context-sensitive grammars. So in this course, we will only do context-free grammars, where everything on the left-hand side is just a single terminal, a uh, single uh, variable or non-terminal. Okay, just, I just want you to be aware of, you know, context-sensitive or uh, grammars that are not context-free. We're only interested in context-free grammars in this course. Okay, uh, and of course today we'll see more, uh, more examples of uh, grammars. So in this case, uh, let's then write the formal definition of a grammar. So a grammar, or a context-free grammar, grammar is a quadruple so the finite automaton was a, a five tuple this is a quadruple uh, it has uh, now instead of Q what do we have here so in, in, uh, in finite automata we had a set of states here we have a set of variables yeah exactly F variables or uh, non-terminals and then we have an alphabet we can call it an alphabet sigma or we can call it a set of terminals T same thing you can also call it sigma if we want the set of terminals and you have what yeah can you the thing that oh thank you very much yes yeah okay there's, uh, I should have a checklist every day to, to remember to do all the things that I have to do before we start. And uh, I forgot one thing today. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, we have a set of terminals. And what else do we have? Yeah, the rules or the productions, which correspond to what in, in finite automata? The transition. Yeah, they conceptually correspond to transitions. So this P is a set of products. So V, V is <coughs> a finite set of variables or non-terminals. Sometimes they are called non-terminals. And T is a finite set of terminals. You can think of T as the alphabet also, same thing. Uh, and P, now what should the relation between the set V and the set T be? They're both symbols, but what should the relationship be between these two sets of symbols? They should be disjoint sets. You cannot have a, any intersection. You should use different symbols for uh, uh, for uh, terminals and non-terminals. So uh, V and T are or must be disjoint sets and in our terminology 
if you look at this, how, how are we distinguishing between terminals and non-terminals? How are we ensuring that there are two disjoint sets? Yeah, exactly. We use uppercase for variables or non-terminals, and we use lowercase for terminals. Uh, in, in, uh, there are other notations that you can see in other books, probably older books, that where they, uh, they underline the terminals. So if you see this <coughs> uh, with the terminals underlined, it's just another notation or another way of distinguishing between terminals and non-terminals. I think in our case, this is more convenient. So lowercase is a terminal, uppercase is a variable. And we have P, which is a set of productions. <coughs> and we have what else? So what did we have in, uh, in finite automata? So this corresponds to the states, this corresponds to the alphabet, this corresponds to uh, the transitions. And what else did we have in finite automata? What's that? Final states and start states. Yeah, so we have the start variable S. So S is, here we call it S, the start. Now S must belong to what? Which set? The set of variables. Yeah, it's a variable. So S belongs to the set of variables is the start variable. Every grammar must have a start variable and our convention is to always define the start variable first. So in any grammar uh, the convention that we will follow is defining the start variable first then you define all other variables. Okay. Uh, now, this is, this is what a, a context-free grammar is. Now, the, the concept of a derivation. A derivation is using a grammar to derive a certain string or generate a certain string. So, derive or generate. But in the context of grammars, we use the word derive. So, last time we derived, uh, so let's derive uh, you know, A, 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 B, B, B. So deriving A, 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 B, 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 we just, uh, we start with the start variable, which is the root of the tree. Then we substitute either this or this. So we have two alternatives or two options or two productions, two rules. We pick one of them at a time. So S, we substitute, in order to get this, we have to substitute A, S, B. <coughs> Then we should repeat this three times in order to get three A's. So again, we substitute for S, A, S, B. And again, we substitute A, S, B. And the final substitution is epsilon. Yeah. And of course, you know, for, in order for a definition to make sense, well, this is a recursive definition, right? What do we mean by recursive here? Yeah, so it's defined in terms of itself. We are defining S in terms of S. So S appears on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So this is a recursive definition. And in order for a, a recursive definition to make sense, it has to have what? In addition to the recursive rule, you have to have a, a, a direct rule that defines the, uh, the variable uh, directly, uh, not... Uh, uh, not in terms of itself. So we have to have this direct rule or base for the recursion. And this is the recursive part of the definition. Derivation can be done using uh, uh, this derivation tree. Or we can do the derivation textually. We can do it just we say, okay, we start with S, then we say, by rule number one, we substitute ASB for S, so S expands into ASB. 
Oh, let me write it here. I think I will have more space here. So I don't want it to be on. Okay. So, S, using rule 1, we get ASB. Then we use rule 1 again to expand this S into another ASB. So, we get A, ASBB. B. So basically this rule expands this S into ASB or substitutes ASB for S using rule number one. So these are just substitution rules. So then do we apply it again? Yeah, we apply it one more time. Again using rule number one. <coughs> we substitute now ASB for this S. So we do A, 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 S, B, B, B. And again, what we are doing here is substituting for this S, ASB. Okay. And the final substitution is using rule, which rule? Finally, we use rule number two to substitute an epsilon for, for S. You can write an epsilon or just drop it because it's epsilon, the empty string. So you can just say A, 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 B, B, B. Normally, we don't write the epsilon. So it's like you are, you are substituting nothing for S. Okay, so this is a, a derivation. So there are two different uh, methods of representing a derivation, either uh, this uh, textual method or the tree. And when you read the, the string that you derive, you read, how do you read it in the tree? How do you read the derived string? Left to right, you read what? Yes. The leaves. You read the leaves left to right. <coughs> leaf, leaf, leaf. So it's like this. This is how you read the string. You read the string, you read the leaves left to right. And of course, for a complete derivation, in a complete derivation, all of your leaves must be terminals so so when you when some of your leaves are still not terminal you don't have a complete derivation yet you are in the middle of a derivation so if at some point you know you don't have a, like uh, this this is an incomplete derivation because you still have a leaf that is not a terminal okay so in this case, we say that, you know, S derives A, 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 B, B, B. Or we can say S star A, 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 B, B, B. So this notation here means that S derives A, A, B, B, but the star means that this, there can be multiple steps that lead from S to A, A, to this string. And these are the steps. <coughs> so you use this for a single substitution. You use this to uh, abstract multiple substitutions. You can go from S to A, A, B, B, B. Okay, so let's take another example. Uh, uh, well, let's, let me write a grammar and then let's figure out the language. What does this language generate? Uh, or what does this uh, grammar? S is A S A or B 
BSB or epsilon. Okay, now how many how many productions do we have? Three. We have three productions or rules. Now, what does this? What language does this grammar uh, generate? Uh, well, let's try to do some derivations. So, what if I do this? S, I can substitute ASA. So, let me substitute ASA. Then, let me try to substitute BSB. Then, I can substitute either ASA or BSB or Epsilon. Let me substitute BSB again. Then let me substitute epsilon. What's the string that gets generated here? Let's read the leaves from left to right. A. A. B. 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 Uh, B, B. B, B. A. A. Okay. So what can you say about this string? Or can you generalize it? I mean, what? Uh, what property do all the strings that are derived using this grammar have? <coughs> well, this is one property, yes. They will always have an even number of A's and B's. That's true, but that's not all. That's not, uh, you know, it doesn't generate all the strings that have an even number of A's and B's. It generates something more specific than just an even A's, an even number of uh, an even number of A's and an even number of B's. Yes? Does it start and end on the same character? What's that? It's, well, again, it starts and ends with the same character. Yes, that's true, but it's more specific. So this is not... Uh, that's true, but the strings that belong to this language have a more specific and uh, a stronger property. Yes? Palindrome. Yeah, exactly. So this generates palindrome. So this is the language here, W is the set of strings W such that W is a, well, but does it generate all palindromes? What kind of palindromes does it generate? Mm. So it doesn't generate all palindromes. So this is a palindrome here, A, B, A. Does it generate this? Okay. So it's, yeah, it, it generates even length palindromes. So is an even length <coughs> palindrome. And an even length palindrome is, you can also uh, describe it as you know, you can split it in half, and if this is W, what can you say about this? W. WR, the reverse, yeah. You can write it L. Another way of writing this is the set of strings W, W, R, such that W belongs to sigma star or T star whether you call the set of terminals sigma or t. Here we are calling the set of terminals sigma. So it's WWR. Okay, now the next question is, how do we modify this, gra uh, this grammar to generate all palindromes, not only, not only even length palindromes? And of course, our alphabet, let's write it explicitly. is a b on this alphabet how do we modify this grammar such that it generates all kinds of palindromes yes you change to so it's just b s or s b b s or what what do you mean b s so 
You would just, instead of having two Bs, you would just take one out. No, this is not going to do it. Yeah? Can you just put uh, A and a B as the other um, terminals? Yeah, exactly. So if you do this, If you add rule number four, A, rule number five, B, then this, uh, this will generate all, you know, even and odd length uh, palindrome. So to make sure that we verify this, so we can say A, S, A, B, S, B, uh, B, S, B, and then, you know, we can substitute for S what we can have. If we, if we put an epsilon, we'll get an even length. If we put an A, you know, this is going to be the symbol in the middle. So this is going to give us what? A, B, B, A. I just put this space so that we can read it. Uh, a, B, B, A. So you have your something in the middle. And then... This is your W, this is your WR. But in the middle, you have some character. Okay, so we change this into a grammar that has five rules. So now it's no longer an even length palindrome. It's a palindrome. Okay, so how would you modify this? So this is going to be a WWR. Uh, w, let's say, X, <coughs> WR. Such that W belongs to sigma star. And X belongs to? Sigma. Sigma. Or, in fact, it should be sigma sub epsilon where sigma sub epsilon is sigma union, sigma sub epsilon is, as we defined for NFAs, is sigma union epsilon. Okay, so in the middle you can put epsilon or you can put any symbol from the alphabet. Uh, any questions on this? Now, I can write, you know, to show you that there are multiple ways. There can be multiple ways for writing a grammar. I can write this grammar as S, A, S, A, or B, S, B, or, uh, you know, M where M is whatever goes in the middle, and then I can define M as what's M? So I just took these three options and called them M. So M is just epsilon or A or B. So this is another way of defining the grammar. Yeah, this could be a, um, you know, a, a, for, in my opinion, this is uh, better. I mean, it's, this is subjective, but uh, yeah, it, this looks better to me because this is a variable and this variable can be anything. And in fact, you know, what if the, the alphabet has more symbols, then you will just, you put them here, you put them in here, and then you can extend... Um, then you can extend this easily. So if you have a C or a D, you can add them. But anyway, so this is just another way of writing the same grammar. So this, uh, this grammar is equivalent to this grammar. Yes? So if you add another variable, can you still do the S transition to the star? Oh, yes. The, yeah, you, we can still. So we can do a derivation like, okay, we can do this. Let's derive... Let's derive what? A, uh, A, B, A, B, A. Let's derive this. So we can say S using, okay, now using rule number one, two, three. 
and then this is rule one, two, three. Each one has three rules. So we substitute for S using rule number one. We substitute uh, what? ASA. Then using rule number two, we substitute what? B, A, S, A, B. Okay. Sorry, it's, uh, you have the A's, and then you substitute B, S, B for the S, and then using rule number three, you substitute an M for S. So now there is A, B, M, B, A. Then, <laughs> using rule number what? What are we trying to generate? We're trying to generate this. So this is our M. So we substitute A for, an, for the M. So using rule number two, we get A, B, A, B, A. And then we can say S derives a, B, A, B, A.